This is Rainmaker FM, the digital marketing podcast network. It's built on the Rainmaker platform, which empowers you to build your own digital marketing and sales platform. Start your free 14-day trial at rainmakerplatform.com. Greetings, super friends. My name is Sonia Simone, and these are the confessions of a pink-haired marketer. For those who don't know me, I'm a co-founder and the chief content officer for Copy Blogger Media. I'm also a champion of running your business and your life according to your own rules. As long as you don't lie and you don't hurt people, this podcast is your official pink permission slip to run your business or your career exactly the way you think you should. And today it's question time again. I've got four more questions from the audience. I really appreciate you guys. And if you want to leave a question to be answered in a future episode, you can just scroll all the way down to the comments and leave one for me there. If you're picking this up on iTunes, you can find the podcast at pinkhairedmarketer.fm. And I would love to hear your questions and love to hear your thoughts for future episodes. So first one comes from Nate Smith over at pen9creative.com. And I'll give all these folks a link in the show notes so that you can go check out what they do. And I love his question. What advice would you give to perfectionists who struggle to get over themselves or their fear of not being good enough and launch a minimum viable product? So this is a super good question. It happens a lot. And a lot of times it happens among the people who are most qualified to put out something that would really be useful. And it comes from thinking too much about yourself, which is totally natural and normal. Instead of thinking so much about who am I to help or I'm not sure I'm ready yet, think about the people that you will help with your product or your service. So you don't ask yourself, well, who am I to help if you see somebody fall down in the street? You just get on over there and you ask how you can be of assistance. If you start with a commitment that if your product or service isn't a good fit, that you're going to try and pass them along to something that's going to work better, or at least that let them know that you're not a right solution, that helps a lot as well. Just remind yourself that you are not going to go out and try and sham wow everybody into buying your product or your service, even if you're not a good fit. That will help you kind of reassure the, the crazy making part of your head that it's okay to move forward because there are people out there who need what you can do and you can actually help them out. And just coming from a very tactical place, sometimes a Q&A session can be a really good confidence booster for this kind of situation with your headspace. It's also a really good way to get product ideas, ideas for ways that you can help the audience. And you can just set this up. It's obviously very helpful if you have some kind of a following, like you have an email list that people have opted in to get news from you, or you have a good Facebook following, a good Twitter following. Ask your audience what they would like to ask you about. Do a Q&A session, free Q&A session. There are lots of free conference calling services out there you can use, so it doesn't have to cost anything. You could also do it as a Google Hangout and schedule a time, let people know about it. Collect questions in advance if you can. That'll help with the confidence boosting part. And it's also going to help you go back and glean product ideas and just get that understanding of your audience. And then hold the live Q&A session. This is a huge confidence booster because it really helps demonstrate to you and to your audience, but most important to you, that you do have solutions that will help people solve the problems that they care about. This kind of mentality can also set in if you're starting too big. So try and solve a smaller problem that's still meaningful if you find that you're just not moving forward because you're intimidated by the idea of releasing. And a minimum viable product means the smallest product or the smallest service, the smallest bundle, package, what have you, that you can market that still solves a meaningful audience problem. And then finally, this is why it's really helpful for business owners to have a network. I find that especially the people who are the most capable, there's a funny thing that happens where sometimes the people who are least capable have plenty of confidence and they don't have this problem and they don't relate to this problem. But I often find the people who are most capable have a hard time believing in themselves, probably because they're constantly questioning their own abilities and working to get better. So that's why they're good. You never believe in yourself as much as your colleagues believe in you. So try and get a professional network together. And um, Nate's actually part of our authority community. So he's got that network in place. And just 
lean on that network sometimes. Sometimes you do need a little help from your friends and it's totally cool to ask for it and we're happy to give it. So the second question comes from Mike Baker and he is at RadioNowhere.net and I would love to encourage everybody to go check out his music and check out his website because he's got a great sound. I'm really, really enjoying the sound of his music. He's really good. And Mike asks, um, I love your stuff in general and find ways to apply it to my business. I'm a singer-songwriter operating under the name Radio Nowhere, and I sound something like a cross between Lyle Lovett and Led Zeppelin. And I will add my note. I also get some Leonard Cohen and maybe some Richard Thompson going on in there. I really, this is like totally my kind of music. So Mike has a free EP at his website if you want to check it out. However, I, Mike, find that some basic marketing stuff doesn't exactly map neatly onto music promotion. Music doesn't directly solve a problem or alleviate a pain, for example, so crafting an effective content strategy and lead magnet can be tough. And it is a different thing to market art or to market music or to market um, cute shoes than it is to market, you know, dentistry or copywriting or website design. They are different creatures and they do require a little bit of a different approach. So I will start with a caveat, which is I am definitely not in any way an expert on marketing music. Uh, the question did inspire me to reach out to John T. Unger, who is an artist who creates these really cool fireballs. They're just really neat and amazing. And he's also a really good marketer. So John has let me know that he is going to be available for a podcast with us uh, on a future episode. So kind of circle back if this idea of marketing creative work is something that you would like to hear more about. I had a couple of thoughts just looking at your site. I think you're on the right track, taking what works for a quote unquote product and adapting it. Use what works, don't use what doesn't make sense. Um, I would say that if I were you, I might include some more calls to action to do something that gets you some financial support. So you know, more calls to action to do something like pick you up on iTunes that's available on your website as something that I could do immediately when I hit your site, but I don't necessarily um, go through your email list to do that. Sometimes with marketing, you have people at hello, they just really like what you're doing and they want to support you right away. So cater to those people, um, have some purchase opportunities, a CD, an iTunes, a 99 cent single, a an album, whatever it might be. And as a musician, I mean, it's really about collecting the audience. It's really about building the audience. I think the thing that's really different is it's less about asking what they want and more about attracting who digs what you are. So you're not going to bend around how you make music to give people a marketable product, right? We already have lots of people who do that. And we all have our, you know, you can insert the name of your favorite sellout musician here who might be really talented, but they're mostly producing music product that's designed for commercial viability. That's not really what you're about, although I'm sure you wouldn't mind a little commercial success. I think, again, I, I just love your sound. I think a lot of people would. I would think about that thousand true fans model. So what can you give the people who are nuts for you? And, you know, how can you pull more people together? This might be something Facebook might be really good for. I'm not sure if you're on Facebook or not. So, of course, you're going to let people know about concerts, where to listen to you live. But, you know, how could the people who love you make a greater contribution to your ability to pay your rent? <laughs> it could be, you know, box set CDs. It could be T-shirts. It could be, I don't know what it could be. It could even be like a live event where you hang out with people and talk about music and talk about and listen to stuff and you play some music and people get to know you. So think about that. Brainstorm some ways that the people who love you could do more for you and don't be afraid to ask for it. You know, come out and say, look, um, I'm a musician. Making a living as a musician is super hard. We all know that. And if you value what I do, then I would love it if you would do this thing. Go pick up my CD, even if you don't listen to CDs, you know. The other thing about music and art is people are looking for souvenirs. So they come to an event and you make them feel awesome, or they even come to your website and you make them feel awesome because you have this beautiful sound. Give them the opportunity to buy a little piece of that experience in the form of, you know, for musicians, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a t-shirt, it's a CD, 
It's a, a single on iTunes. It's an album on iTunes. But think about that souvenir that people can have in exchange for you making them feel good. They want to take a little piece of that experience home with them. So before I move on forward, I wanted to let you know that the Confessions of a Pink-Haired Marketer are brought to you today by Authority Rainmaker. Authority Rainmaker is a live event. It's not exactly a conference. It's an educational experience that offers the benefits of a conference. So we put together a complete, effective online marketing strategy, and we're all about helping you immediately accelerate your business. And we've brought in some people like Dan Pink, Sally Hogshead, punk legend Henry Rollins, who we are all like dying to see what he has to say to us, and a lot of other just really super smart people live. And of course, the secret sauce is building real world relationships with other attendees. And I would love to connect with you there. So if you want to come hang out with us and learn a lot about how to be a smarter marketer, you can get the details at rainmaker.fm slash event. And we look forward to seeing you, Denver, Colorado, this May, rainmaker.fm slash event. So the next question comes from someone I met at last year's Rainmaker event, and that's Darren Dimitatis. He's over at intertwinemarketing.com. And here's Darren's question. I'm getting some traction with my blog where I offer e-commerce and SaaS search marketing tips, but not a ton of engagement. As I look at who I am and my best customers, I decided to take my business in a faith-based direction. 85 to 90% of what I blog and podcast won't change, but I've been struggling to connect deeper with my audience. After talking to some people, uh, Demian Farnworth, who's of course on our copy blogger team, and Sonia Thompson, who's one of our certified content marketers. Also, Darren is also a certified content marketer. I've decided to jump all in. Today, I updated my homepage copy to say, search marketing for Christian entrepreneurs. My question is, how can I work this angle in without alienating the people who signed up, but are not very engaged, to build a tribe around this new audience? So first of all, smart, smart, smart. Getting more specific is an amazing way to, to build more engagement, more loyalty. It gets more attention. It helps keep attention. So focusing on a, a particular tribe that you want to serve is a really smart thing to do. And it opens up all kinds of new doors that you weren't even able to see before. And this question actually applies to a lot of businesses because we change directions all the time. A big part of smart content marketing is to keep paying attention and keep adjusting your sales to catch the wind that's blowing rather than wishing you had some other kind of wind. So here's what I think you should do. I would announce what you're doing. I would announce the new direction, let people know who are on your list, and then just move forward. And, you know, if you want to take this approach, you can definitely make the statement that you're happy to work with anyone, but that your faith informs how you see the world and how you behave as a professional. And so you're going to be talking more about that. Now, some people on your list are going to be more attracted, and some people are going to feel neutral about it, and some people are going to move away to another provider. You are going to alienate some people, and that is totally okay. You know, be respectful. Communicate that you respect all points of view, all faiths, but don't get too worried about alienating people who are going to be turned off by that message. Let them sort themselves. As a rule of thumb, don't worry about alienating people who aren't that into you anyway. Be who you are, be ethical, be a good egg, and then let people decide if they're alienated or not, if they're a good fit or not. The right ones will come closer, and the ones who were never really that into you anyway will drift away, and that's normal and healthy and totally okay. And again, I would always advise businesses, if you're moving in a new direction, just let people know and then move forward. Uh, very often people will say, well, I'm doing something different with the blog, or I'm doing something different with my business. Should I start a brand new email list? And in most cases, unless it's really like you're going from – um cake recipes for celiacs to, you know, the best double gluten cake recipes. If you're, if it's not just a completely different world where one is inappropriate for the other, I always advocate move forward with what you have, communicate clearly and let people decide for themselves if they want to stick around or if they want to move away. And of course, that's always contingent on having unsubscribe information really prominent in your email communication, which you need to do anyway to comply with most of the world's spam laws. Plus, you just need to do it because it's the right thing to do. And the final question today comes from Belinda Weaver, and she's at copyrightmatters.com. 
and that's copyrightrite.com. Again, all the links will be in the show notes, so you can go hang out with folks and uh, see more of what they have to offer. Belinda's question is around using content as a lead-in strategy. In your last podcast, talking about questions, in other words, my last podcast, you talked about the power of content to keep people engaged until they're ready to purchase. I understand the idea of creating different kinds of content for different stages of a buying cycle or stages of readiness. Check. So Belinda's question is, do you have any tactical suggestions around a balance of free versus paid? So in other words, free versus paid products that might lead people to the main offer. Are free, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, stepping stones a good idea? Or does the content map need to be a bit more complex? I want to offer the right content at the right moment, but leading people towards an ultimate endpoint. I'd love your thoughts and ideas. So this is a super good question. Chris Garrett wrote an excellent post for us on this on Copyblogger, and we get asked this all the time. And partly the answer to what's free, what's low cost, what's expensive is you go by feel, but I do have a couple of rules of thumb. And so here they are. Easy to solve problems get solved for free. So the, the low hanging fruit, as it's often called, gets solved for free. The frequently asked questions that are pretty easy to move forward with get asked, get solved for free. And also any problems that you have to get resolved before you can become my customer also get solved for free. So for example, a lot of people get business or marketing advice. They read blogs, they get lots of advice, they pick up books, but they lack the confidence to act on it and move forward with the project. And that is the super secret evil marketing purpose behind this podcast is to empower more people to move forward with the business, whether it's a big business or a tiny little side business, so that they can benefit from the tools and education that we sell with our company, Copy Blogger Media. So as you can see, I'm extremely evil. So for an educational kind of product, the more investment of time and energy a solution takes, as a rule of thumb, the more money you should charge for it. And this is partly for kind of a weird reason. People will put more time and energy into something that they pay more dollars for. It just helps focus the attention when you've made a significant financial investment to align that with a significant investment of time and energy. So, you know, attending Stanford University is difficult and they also charge a lot of money. Attending your local community college uh, can be challenging, but it's less difficult than Stanford and it's more accommodating as a rule and they charge less money. So again, it's a rule of thumb. It's not a law of nature, but if you are asking somebody's time, energy, attention. So, you know, a workout routine or an educational product or, you know, consulting them and how they run their business, that's going to be more expensive. You know, something that's a quick fix is will tend to be less expensive, but there is one exception. And the exception is the whole range of products and services that are based around convenience. In a service, this is often called done for you. So instead of teaching someone how to write copy for their web page, you do the writing. Rather than teaching someone how to build a website, you build it for them. And this should always be priced on the higher side. It's a convenience factor. It's pre-washed lettuce, right, that you get at the supermarket. So it's, it's totally okay to pay people for convenience if it's really a one and done kind of thing. They give you the money, they end up with what they want. Now, in terms of the complexity of your content map, Make it as simple as you can and no simpler, which is probably a misquote of Albert Einstein. You'll find that the complexity of the map is going to grow organically. So don't start with a complex idea about what you want to do or what you want to offer. Start with the simplest idea that you can and then let your audience and your client demand be what drives the complexity, if any. So for example, my friend Susan, who offers dog training education, her biggest product is how to get your dog to come when he's called. Now, Susan could pretty much teach your dog to do algebra if that's what you wanted your dog to do. She can teach at a very high level of complexity, and she does, and she gets results with that, but she gets the most results from solving a relatively straightforward issue. So sometimes the right answer is the simple answer, and whether that's the case for you is going to come out of your audience and out of your clients. So those are four questions. Thank you guys again so much for asking such interesting, pertinent questions that are really coming from the trenches of your businesses. 
If you are enjoying the show, I would love a rating or a comment over on iTunes. That just helps me tremendously. And thank you so much for those who have already left a review or a comment. I just appreciate that so much. The Confessions of a Pink-Haired Marketer have been brought to you today by Authority Rainmaker. And it's a live educational experience. It gives you a complete, effective online marketing strategy. Get all the details right now over at rainmaker.fm slash event. We would all love to see you. The entire Copy Blogger Media team would just love to meet you and connect with you in Denver, Colorado this May. Rainmaker.fm slash event. Thank you all so much for your time and attention and take care. <laughs>